We'll now be linking up with our rights Abuja studio to have a chat on the impact of coronavirus on global poverty and human rights with Dr. Usini Abdul, Nigeria Country Director for Plan International. He also served in the same capacity with Action Aids. Welcome to the morning show, Dr. Abdul. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Good morning. Doctor. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. Well, Dr. Abdul, well, someone was uh, telling me that the rich are buying stocks at this critical time, while the poor are stockpiling uh, toilet papers. And I guess the person was uh, pointing in the direction of how coronavirus is, all, is further alienating people and further uh, deepening uh, poverty. How, in your view, does uh, coronavirus deepen poverty, and what are the long-term implications? I think the implications are massive, and, I, and you have actually set that pace in your earlier conversations around what is ha happening globally and how that is actually having a very significant impact uh, on the economies of uh, different regions around the world. But like we all know, um, Africa generally is on the margin of the global economy. And many times people, when, when we have conversation around globalizations, we still feel that Africa is actually operating within the very, very of that globalizations. And in essence, what it means is that it's not a major player uh, in the global political economy. And therefore, uh, if this ha happens to affect significantly uh, the, epi the centers of these global economies, it's bound to have a boomerang effect on many African, on many African countries. And we're beginning, to see, we're beginning to see that once there is a complete collapse in the systems uh, globally, uh, Africa will naturally be, be at, the receiving, at the receiving end of it. I don't actually believe that the poor are actually buying toilet papers. They actually don't even have the resources to buy toilet papers. These are poor people who actually do open defecations, and therefore they don't even have toilets to use toilet papers for. What basically we are saying is that the majority of the poor people, uh, their livelihood depends on daily activities. And once you obstruct those daily activities, they are bound to be deeply, deeply pushed uh, to the margin of their lives. And that is what we are beginning to see. So this is going to have a massive implication for global poverty. And that is the conversation that we are not seeing. The main conversations are largely around the mega economy, what is happening to these talks. As important as those conversations are, we still believe that there are a lot of people that actually live on the margins of this society. And in most parts of Africa, they are actually the majority. And that if we, whatever action we take, whatever decision we make, if we don't put them into cognizance at the end of this crisis, because ultimately it will end, at the end of this crisis, the aftermath will be really, really daring to the people. Thank you, Doctor. Earlier on, during our conversation around the news headlines, Dr. Abati made a reference to the Marshall Plan. For the benefit of our viewers, I'm going to try and remember my third year history. <laughs> the Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe after World War II. So having that mentioned now, for me, creates a lot of anxiety. World War II decimated the economy of Europe and killed between 70 and 85 million people. So the United States um, U.S. Secretary of State then, Marshall, pumped $15 billion into rebuilding Europe. Now, if such a phrase or such a term is being invoked now to rebuild Europe, the you know, developed world. What happens to us in Nigeria, the poverty capital of the world? Hmm. Well, that, that, that's a very important conversation. Um, yes, of course, people are talking about Marshall Plan, but we also recognize that even before this coronavirus pandemic, uh, most European economies are also on a very shaky note. And therefore, um, the, the pandemic will rather uh, only push, push them um, to, another, to another level. Otherwise, and I, I think uh, the economies have been really, really slow uh, in the last 15 years for many of, the, for, for many of these economies in, 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 in Europe. And the conversation around Marshall Plan is also not very much different from the whole conversation that this is another war. Because the whole issue about war is about its devastation. 
the, what, what, what it brings on the track, and, and, and that's what we are seeing. So the Italian, the, the Italian president, we actually say that, look, uh, we haven't seen this since the Second World War. The German chancellor, we actually say that this is another war. So in Spain, it does the conversation. So if you go through, and the last time you had a Marshall Plan was actually after the Second World War, and now today you are faced with that reality that you are actually comparing with your experience in the Second World War, then ultimately you need to respond to it, particularly now that the economies were not as strong as they even used to be. Because the European economies before the Second World War was much more stronger than they are today because they were economies that were largely attached to the, colonials, to the colonial system around the world. They were boxing in all the euphorias of their strength and the entities they control in different parts of, in different parts of the globe before the second man uh, at the point of the second world war but today that is no longer the, that's no longer the case the dynamics of economy has shifted significantly china has become a major 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 player in the world economy and the the, the important the strength of the european economy has weakened significantly to the advantage of china and therefore if you go through this, surely you will need another plan. You may not call it a Marshall plan, but you need a plan that will invest in the system, strengthen the system better, and ensure the economy does much better. And what's the implication for Nigeria? Yes, of course, we say it is a poverty capital, not necessarily because it's the headquarters of it, but because a large concentration of people are living, are living, in, the, in, 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 are living in poverty. And so what it means is that there's a lot of lessons that we have, to, we have to learn as a country, that if the rich countries are beginning to talk about post-pandemic post plan and what they can do to strengthen their economies, if we should begin to think even beyond, even beyond that, because without this crisis, we are already in a very significant mess in terms of our economy, in terms of the depth of poverty in the country. It also means that we don't need this crisis to actually recognize that we need to actually do more to deal with some of those realities, because we don't even want this thing to, ex to escalate. Because once it's escalated, our system is incapable, it's incapable of containing it. We, it. It just cannot cope with it. And therefore, we need to even do more to ensure, one, that it does not escalate, and two, to ensure that its impact in the other part of the world does not have a major, major impact on us locally here, even at the end of the crisis. Well, Dr. Abdul, I like the point you've made about preventing escalation. And that's the thinking of, uh, you know, governments, authorities uh, all over the world. But some persons have raised questions about the erosion of fundamental human rights. In other words, when you ask people to stay at home, you are curtailing their freedom of uh, movement and association. When you ask people not to congregate in churches or in other large uh, gatherings, you are curtailing, again, their freedom of uh, association, their freedom of choice. What should be important to the world at this time? Human rights or the safety of the world? And do you see the possibility that after coronavirus uh, epidemic, some persons can come forward uh, with some litigations about how their rights have been violated? Where is the trade-off? I think we need both, Dr. Abati. Yeah, I, I think we don't need a trade-off here, Dr. Abati. I, I really think that we need both. Uh, we need our safety, we need to get out of this safe and alive, and two, we also need our human right. So it's not, and, and this has become a major conversation globally, and in fact, they have taken this conversation to major ideological or polemical realm, where uh, people are saying the China model or the European model. The China model gave you quick result, and typical of an authoritarian of authoritarian approach to issues, you may actually have a very quick result, but what about the sustainability of it? And then people talk about the European model, and there are conversations, if you go, it's a massive debate all over the world now about which approach is the best. And people's, people are beginning to question the whole conception of right or the liberal environment and how that itself is leading to this kind of situation. But I will not approach it from this perspective. I think for me, is that, look, our rights are very important as, as people, but the whole concept of right is actually built on the need to safeguard, to support, to support both um, our communities and our systems. And the idea about it is that, look, we need this right, 
but our people, our leaders need to communicate and communicate more and say that, look, we are not in any way trying to undermine uh, your fundamental right, but we are trying to ensure that we all en enjoy collective right to life. Because we have to be alive for us to even uh, enjoy the rights to religion, freedom of association, movement, and all that. And that's because our freedom of movement, association, religion, and all that are dependent on actually we being alive or we being healthy, that we should ensure that we enjoy healthy life uh, um, uh, and do everything to ensure we have that before we begin to maybe assert this, this other right. And I think if this explanation comes, if we communicate well, we wouldn't need to get to a level where there will be massive clan down because when we mobilize people, people will voluntarily self-isolate. People will voluntarily go on self-quarantine. I don't think anybody wants to commit suicide. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to get infected with coronavirus and all that. But we have to communicate. We have to take people to that level. But this is not an issue of trade-off. It's not an issue of trade-off. Because, again, if you use force to clamp down on people, you can surely not avoid litigation post-coronavirus. Thank you for that point. If proper communication is used, individuals will, for the most part, willingly suspend certain rights that are guaranteed but not even unqualified for the greater good. We even have in our Constitution, Section 35E, under Chapter 4, Fundamental Human Rights, that mentions if you have an infectious or contagious disease, your freedom of movement has to be restricted. It's common sense. It should be properly communicated. What is your assessment of communication at all levels so far? But we'll take a short break now. You can, you know, mull on your answer, and we'll take it when we come back. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Still with us is Dr. Husseini Abdu, Nigeria Country Director for Plan International. He also served in the same capacity with Action Aid. Thank you for staying with us, Doctor. Dr. Thank you very Abdu? much. Yes, very good. Well, I mean, if you may respond to uh, the question that was posed to you by uh, Tundum Should before I repeat we went on it? break. I wanted your assessment of communication at all yeah. levels so far, since we all understand how important communication is to get the buy-in of the general public, the willing buy-in, without having to coerce people. I think typically, uh, as a country, we, we are surely not doing well in terms of, in terms of communication, and, and, and that's quite a big shame. And, and, and I don't know, uh, as a country, and irrespective of level, whether it's state, national, or local government level, is that we have still not begun to see effective communication as a fundamental element of leadership. You can't lead people without effective communication. Whether it is a direct one, it's an indirect communication, communication has become a major, major, and fundamental element of leadership. And... At this level, we're in a crisis situation. And in a crisis, leadership requires crisis communication. And if we want to draw on a crisis communication, then it has to be deep, it has to be strong, it has to be coordinated. And this is not what uh, we are seeing at this moment. We are seeing sporadic issues and information being shared left, right, and center. Yes, we have seen... Uh, the whole attempt through the, the, the National Center for Disease Control in terms of tracking, what is the number on each day, on daily basis, how we, which state has been so far affected and how many people. Very good. But that is just one element of the communication. The other element of the communication is a direct conversation with people, letting people recognize the challenges they are actually faced and mobilizing them, galvanizing them, inspiring them to, to accept that we are faced with this reality and working on them to begin to take individual, collective, family and corporate actions that can help to guard against escalations. 
So we, we're, not, we're not seeing this. There are no much information around testing centers. Where do we have them in each of the state? There is not this whole coordinated approach. The messagings are not the same. Yeah, Lagos could be an isolation in terms of, yeah, Lagos has always been a bit slightly different uh, compared to many other, many other states. But we, we're just not there in terms of communication. And this is what is allowing for rumor to the whole thing that uh, Dr. Abati was talking about earlier, about people saying, no, it doesn't affect black people, or it doesn't come in a particular temperature level, or in that you need to pray, and when you pray, God. So uh, uh, that's what is leading, giving room for, for these kind of talks. But once we are able to coordinate communications, and we become more effective and a bit more aggressive, with this communication, we should be able to deal with it. But leadership, effective communication in our leadership style is just not one of those things we do here, and we must do it. Well, Dr. Abdu, uh, central banks are, and governments across the world have been trying to provide what they call COVID-19 <laughs> stimulus packages to help the unemployed, to help even big corporations, to help small businesses, to help households. Uh, to deal with the effect of coronavirus in terms of how it has affected purchasing power opportunities, uh, if you like, poverty, the emerging poverty map of the world. And in Nigeria here, we have had the case of the CBN also introducing some stimulus measures uh, up to the tune of about one trillion naira for small businesses and also for pharmaceuticals. And I think over the weekend, the Central Bank of Nigeria named some pharmaceutical companies that will benefit. What's your assessment of the uh, steps taken so far by the Nigerian government, including uh, the devaluation of the Naira, which they say is technical devaluation. I don't know what they mean by that. Devaluation is devaluation, or what they call adjustment of uh, price. And then the benchmarking of uh, pump price of petrol with the spot price of uh, crude oil. Do you think that these measures uh, go far enough in Nigeria as a way of addressing uh, poverty and the people's distress, or there are certain steps that need to be taken additionally, monetary policy-wise and fiscal policy-wise? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, and, and for me, this is just the challenge. And this is the trend we are seeing all over the world. Uh, we, we, we said, we, we saw that uh, uh, previously. In all the major economic shocks that the world has experienced uh, in the last 30 years or so, uh, significantly government begins to invest in terms of bailing out major corporate entities that governments believes that are very important to the economy and expecting that once those bailouts occur, then it could have a multiplier effect on the other segment that may not have been bailed out. But evidence had actually shown clearly that this doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work if particularly even in the poorer country where the informal economy is actually larger than the formal economy. And so what we have seen in the Nigerian context is that the central bank response, and this is not to underestimate what they have done, uh, commendable as, um, as it is, but the reality, actually, is that it's responding to a particular segment of the economy that is probably, and this is with due respect to people who are in this, is probably less significant uh, compared to where uh, the majority of the people, where their life actually lies, and nobody is actually talking about, talking about them uh, in, in, in any way. Pharmaceutical, yes, excellent. That's a, very, that's a very good idea. But we need to recognize that this is not necessarily um, around the, the, the pandemic. Even though, yes, to some extent, the pandemic might have contributed to it, some of them are hangovers of certain uh, poor policy prescriptions that we have made in the past that we have sustained, despite uh, knowing clearly well that they are actually not, not working for the, for, the, for the economy. So there's a lot that we can actually do in terms of monetary policy, and there's a lot we can actually also do in terms of our fiscal, in our, in our fiscal policy. And, 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 the, and that, for me, is how our policies directed at the poor directly uh, instead of expecting that the poor will only benefit from the populations of the benefit from the larger corporate from the larger corporate world, because we are sure that there are a lot of blockages out there that it doesn't get to the poor. And take this for instance: 
if this whole thing escalates, and we don't pray that it escalates, a lot of businesses will shut down. It is, it is easy to approach, to do the American approach, where you can actually support people by paying through the payroll. So if a business shut down and it's shutting down for three months and it said, look, after one month, we are not able to pay salaries. The government could easily say that, OK, we will pay for the next two months. And therefore, the government can pay through the existing payrolls. And those $1,000 $1, could actually get to the people. In Nigeria, if you want to pay through the payroll, you'll probably be getting uh, across to less than 10 percent of the Nigerian population. Because a lot of our, a lot of our people are uh, actually not in any way uh, 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 attached in the formal employment formations. And that is what has even made government poverty alleviation measures a bit extremely difficult because you need to develop a role. You need to build that role because it doesn't exist. So you build a role and try to see how you can support through that role. And in most in most cases, those role people break into them through corrupt means, and people who are supposed to benefit end up not benefiting. I think we need a more creative and more robust approach to get across to the people. Uh, Dr. Abati, and the concern you should have, for instance, I'm in Abuja, and we don't pray for it, but we have to prepare for it. If there's any massive escalation and Abuja has to shut down, there are a lot of people whose livelihood depends on daily activities. So imagine shutting down for two weeks, because when you shut down, you have to, the minimum you can actually do is two weeks. That's the minimum. And so if you shut down for two weeks, and these people whose life depends on daily activities, what are we going to do about it? How do we get food across to them? How do we sustain their livelihood? How do we ensure their children don't starve? Who is having this conversation? How are we leading this conversation? It is doable. But the government as it is, that is currently constituted, has no capacity for that. And people who have capacity to support the government in delivering and, and, and providing this kind of support, uh, actually, they, there is no conversation taking place. There is no conversation. And so if there is no conversation, it actually means that policies can only be instituted to support formal entities and corporate bodies, sadly. Well, Dr. Hussaini Abdul, thank you very much for joining us on The Morning Show this morning and for your very articulate and insightful contributions. Thank you very much indeed.